Okay, so uh, please introduce yourself and what company you're with. So uh, I'm Seth Gibson, and I'm a pipeline technical director for Microsoft Game Studios, uh, the Halo franchise. Okay, and uh, when did you first realize that you were morphing into a technical artist from your original role? Um, it was actually by choice. Um, you know, I actually build myself as a technical artist going into games, and uh, what happened was I, you know, I started off as effects, and then somebody figured out that I knew how to write Mel scripts, and from there I just kind of became a technical artist. So. That's great. So can you provide an example from a project you worked on that required your specific skills as a technical artist to solve? Oh yeah, okay. um, Halo Reach is a great example. Actually for Halo Reach, uh, we decided coming off of Halo 3 and ODST that we wanted to redo the pipeline completely. You know, we wanted you know, we want new artist tools, we wanted new data interface tools, and so it was kind of one of those, you know, without people there to write the, the DCC code, you know, the new Maya tools, the new Max tools, like, yeah, it just, it wouldn't have happened, so. Okay. Uh, now, did you come from the art or from the programming side, or were you uh, always you, you're always yes, a technical artist? I, I started as a programmer in high school, kind of like when I was younger, coming up, and then uh, got to college. Realized that programming is actually really hard, so uh, I liked art. Realized I wasn't good at art, so somewhere in the middle, I was like, oh, maybe there's maybe there's something here. And then uh, I actually took a course that uh, introduced me to things like Mel and you know DCC scripting, and that was kind of where where I kind of figured, oh, I can actually make money doing this. So. That's cool. Um, so, how much of your learning was self-directed versus formal education, and like, what kinds of self-directed learning did you engage in? Um, so, I actually went to a 12-week uh, training session, you know, similar like Nomon uh, for Maya, and we had a little bit of Mel courseware, but yeah, most of it has been most of it has been self-taught up to the last couple of years when you know I started doing a lot of things like C Sharp and Python, and you know, you know, thank you Autodesk for including that in Maya, and uh, you know, so so you know, once you once you get to a point where you can take advantage of learning tools that are available in community. That's, that's the way to go, and that's been a big help. Like, I think I've actually grown probably a lot more in the last couple of years because I've had access to bigger learning communities. So. Oh, that's also important. Um, so, like, what types of mathematics do you find yourself regularly using? Uh, specific, you know, sort of specific concepts, not like large course related things, but um, things that maybe would fall through the cracks in a normal academic program. Probably nothing. I think. I mean, I think any sort of linear algebra class, for instance, or trigonometry class, is going to give you the basic concepts. But I think the way it's the way you present that to students, because you know, I think to myself, you know, I use matrix math every day now, and it's one of those things that when I was learning it in school, I was like, this is really cumbersome. What am I ever going to do with this? You know, and I think if somebody had said to me, oh no, this is this is the key to making 3D video games, I'm like, oh, geez, well, I'm going to learn this now. So. Okay. Is there anything like uh, really esoteric in 3D vector math, or like? You know, quaternions or um, <laughs> not so it, much. It can be if it's not presented. Again, if it's not yeah. presented properly, it can seem like dark mood. Like, like you know, you mentioned quaternions, especially. That's you know, watching people try to wrap their heads around that the first time. But if, if it's one of those things that you learn and you learn in context, I think it's actually very simple to grasp. So okay, and that's something that we don't do particularly well always in academia. So we'll work on that. Uh, uh, what low-level technical concepts did you have to grok to become an effective TA? Shaders, graphics pipeline, anything else that I'm totally not aware of? Um, so sh shaders and graphic pipeline is a great example because at some point, especially at a smaller company, you are going to be the shader guy. Um, the technology behind animation, the actual math and numbers behind animation and how keyframes work, um, you know, as you get into more advanced animation tools, you, you have to learn that stuff. And, um, you know, C++, how, you know, C++, how it works, things like, uh, you know, how, how APIs work, specific APIs like the Maya API. I mean, I, I had never intended to be a Maya programmer, but uh, just that just goes with the territory at some point, so it is good to know right. programming okay. languages. So. So, so, like, sort of same question on the artistic side. Uh, was there any elements of, of art that you felt you had to come up to speed with coming from the programming side? Yeah, I mean, just the, the whole the whole idea behind how artists think and how artists approach a problem, and that's really just doing it, talking to artists, and, you know, repeat. I mean, that's that's probably the biggest one. So, you know, as a technical artist, you don't have to be, you don't have to be incredibly production competent, but being able to, like, to understand how an artist thinks and how they approach a problem, you know, so it helps to have at least made, you know, some simple contact or something like that, so. Okay. So, so with that, what would be one thing that you would tell academic, you know, all of academia, like this is, if you're making a tech art program, this is key. Um, you have to actually put your tech artists in a production simulated structure. Like they have to be working with artists and engineers. They have to be taking spec from both sides and understanding artists' production problems. Because, you know, because otherwise, you know, you're going to get a bunch of guys that are, you know, that can write Python, that can write Mel. So, um, 
one thing that you would want uh, uh, game educators to know uh, in setting up a technical art program? For, for a tech art uh, curriculum, the most important thing is not so much what's in the curriculum, but that people get to practice. So, you know, putting your students in that position where they're talking to artists and they're talking to engineers and they can practice being that bridge. You know, that's the word we throw around all the time. Tech artists are the bridge. So, but that's something you have to do. You know, you can't, you can't just be the guy that's just kind of off in your own writing scripts and learning Python and learning Mel because the minute you hit production, you're going to have these two people screaming at you and you're going to have no idea how to do it. That's, that's not the way you want to be introduced to the game industry. So. <laughs> okay. Is there, is there anything else that you want us to know? Anything, you know? anything at all? Use the rest of the time in the batteries or on the... <laughs> um, really, you know, like, to, uh, like you've heard, I think technical art by now is a, is a legitimate discipline that deserves to be kind of given its own attention. I mean, you know, this has really been going on for the last couple of years. And you look at the number of technical art talks this year. I mean, even last year, all the technical art talks, even like, I know there was one in the absolute last slot on Saturday, and it was, it was standing remotely. It was a lot of students. So, you know, every time I run into students, they, they want to know what it is you do. How do I do that job? You know, I, I keep hearing about it, but I don't know where to go to learn. So, you know, the, it, it deserves its own attention. <laughs>